Hello everyone, we're going to get started. If everyone can, please have a seat. My name is Priscilla Rader Cole. I'm an attorney and Animal Legal Defense Fund's education coordinator. I'm delighted to act as moderator for an inspiring discussion on animal sanctuaries and the people behind the scenes, ensuring that animals under their care live happily, healthy, and safe lives. With me today is Ed Stewart and Sarah Beckler Davis. Unfortunately, our third panelist, Margie Beach, Director of Education at Animal Place, was unable to join us because of the devastating fires occurring in Northern California. One of the fires is burning a few miles from their Vacaville Sanctuary, and 1,000 animals had to be relocated to their Grass Valley location on Wednesday. She sends her best regards, and we're extremely uh, grateful that everyone is safe and all those affected have been in our thoughts. For this panel, we will reserve time at the end for a Q&A. Ed Stewart co-founded the Performing Animal Welfare Society, otherwise known as PAWS, in 1984 to advocate and provide sanctuary for abandoned, abused, and retired performing animals and victims of the exotic animal trade. Mr. Stewart has positioned PAWS as the leader in the Confront Captivity Movement, which examines the ethics and efficacy of confining wild animals for novelty, education, and conservation. Stewart and Paws co-founder, the late Pat Derby, established the nation's first elephant sanctuary in Galt, California in 1986. Mr. Stewart oversees all aspects of the organization, including its captive wildlife sanctuaries, direct action, uh, direct action advocacy, and legislative efforts. Currently, PAWS op operates three sanctuaries in Northern California, including the 2,300-acre natural habitat ARC 2000 Refuge, and cares for elephants, tigers, lions, bears, and other wild and exotic species. Sarah Beckler Davis, Executive Director of the Humane Society Naples, is also a primatologist, a non-practicing attorney, a nonprofit professional, and a bridge builder. She has worked with and for chimpanzees since 1997. When she first met Washoe, a chimpanzee famous for her use of American Sign Language. Sarah has a graduate degree in primatology from Central Washington University and a Juris Doctor from Lewis and Clark Law School. She was executive director of Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest for its first five years, and in 2010, she co-founded the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, which is an organization dedicated to professionalizing the non-human human primate sanctuary field and improving the overall care of non-human primates in captivity. In 2014, she founded Project Chimps and formed a partnership with the New Iberia Research Center to retire all 220 of their former research chimpanzees. So please join me in welcoming Ed and Sarah. Thank you, Priscilla. Is this uh, loud enough? Can everybody hear me? Okay, I'd, I'd like to throw myself on the mercy of the court after the last, uh, <laughs> the last panel. Uh, we, uh, we try to do the right thing at pause. We have four out of the top five uh, decision makers at pause are women, and uh, they all make more money than I do. So <laughs> I think, <laughs> which is not, not saying much, that's not saying much, for the money part anyway. But the most important thing is that Pat Derby and I founded PAWS uh, 34 years ago now. In uh, 1984, we, uh, we had a, 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 a career before that, especially Pat. She was an animal trainer in Hollywood. She was brilliant in every way. Uh, she was, uh, most of you probably never met Pat, I would guess, but the, those that you that uh, did meet Pat uh, will never forget Pat. Um, the, I lived with Pat for 37 years and one day, and uh, she taught me everything I know about animals, 
about uh, animal welfare, about uh, fighting for animals, and she was a force to be reckoned with for sure. She was the most brilliant person I've ever met. Uh, she was an incredible writer, speaker. Uh, she wrote a book in 1976 that turned out to be the first uh, book about animals and entertainment uh, that was considered an expose. Um, it really wasn't an expose as far as Pat was concerned. It was just uh, recording the details about the life of an animal trainer in Hollywood. Uh, she was an incredible person, had a very high IQ, probably right up there with Rex Tillerson. <laughs> but, and she would just destroy people in debates. That was the best thing. Uh, I saw her on uh, ABC, uh, Good Morning America, one time against a circus spokesperson who introduced himself and never said one more word for the rest of the interview. Uh, she would dominate you, and uh, she made sure that pause was fair to, to everybody and was uh, a small organization that fought as hard as uh, we could fight. Um, people get a lot of bang for their buck uh, when, they, uh, when they support us, and we make sure that, uh, that the money goes right to the animals. Uh, a sanctuary has to be much more than just a place to live for the animals and the, and the people. Uh, it teaches you all kinds of lessons. Um, you know, I sat up on the hill one day trying to just put together a few of the, uh, the, the words that came to mind. You teaches you to empathize with the, the animals that are in your care. Uh, you know, you teach, you learn, you, you uh, study. Um, you connect with other people, you bond with the animals and other people, you sympathize with each other because you're in a situation where you're doing your best and you know your best is not good enough for these animals. And the most important thing is you evolve. I remember starting out in 1984, we really didn't have any plan uh, to be a sanctuary. We had Pat's book, and her image, or her uh, mission, uh, that she was uh, always uh, striving for is to make the, uh, the life better for animals in Hollywood. Uh, that was the first place that we started working, and her book became an expose when all the reporters that inter interviewed her picked out the, the passage where she criticized Walt Disney. When you work in Hollywood and you criticize Walt Disney for his care of animals, you have stepped over the line and you will never go back. And that was fine with her. This was me as a boy. Uh, I'm the one on the, that side, that side. Um, Pat and I, for a short period of time, I worked with her uh, with some of the animals. And honestly, I hated every single minute of it. I grew up in Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. Um, I was the typical Midwestern kid, uh, hamburgers, football, beer. That was pretty much what I was interested in. My father was a Mississippi farm boy, and he taught me that uh, you could have an animal as a pet, as a companion, if you got up in the morning, you brushed the dog, you fed the dog, you watered the dog, you walked the dog, you got a job to make sure you had money for vet bills, and then if you had time, you could eat breakfast before you went to school. And I decided right then and there that I would play with my sister's dog if I needed a companion. When I met Pat, I was working part-time for Lincoln Mercury and probably a lot of you don't even remember uh, this advertising campaign with the Lincoln Mercury Cougar. Uh, Pat was working with Lincoln Mercury probably for about seven or eight years before I met her. Um, she came to, to Cleveland with the Cougar uh, to do an auto show. And I remember the merchandising manager telling me, you have to make sure that the cars are clean, that the spokespeople are up on the cars talking about the cars properly in a, in a timely manner, and also 
you have to take care of this woman from California who is just crazy about uh, the details that she wants for this cougar. And she came into town, I met her. The first thing I did with Pat was pick up the dirty papers after Christopher pooped. And it was uh, pretty much my life from then on. I came to California following Pat, not so much the cougar. And I started to work with her. And when I looked at what was going on in Hollywood, uh, where the animals lived, how they were treated, how they were bought and sold at these animal training compounds, I thought that it was a truth in advertising uh, question, just like the first panel of the day. My background, my, my uh, education was uh, in advertising. And I thought, is, if people knew how bad it was for these animals, nobody would, would go to a, TV, uh, a movie or watch a TV show or buy anything from a, uh, a company that was advertising with animals because they, you think that they would have the best life coming from Hollywood, and it turns out they have the worst life. And I'm talking about even the dogs. When you see a cute dog on TV in a commercial, and you smile and you laugh at how cute it is, it's, it's living in a cage. It's produced to be a working dog, and if it doesn't work, it, it, it doesn't stay. And they live in a cage. I would much rather be somebody's companion animal at home than any animal on TV. I, I cringe every time I see an animal on TV. And in our situation, Lincoln Mercury wanted baby animals every year, they wanted cute animals every year, and, I, and some of the people that were selling those animals were, were disgusting. The, the places were disgusting. They, they, you almost took the animals just to get them out of a horrible situation. So I hated this industry from the very, very beginning, and Pat was at the point where she was ready to leave. Well, this is what the state of the union was back in the, the 60s and 70s. All these TV shows that came along, Pat worked on some of these, Flipper with Rick O'Berry, uh, who you probably know of, uh, Gentle Ben, uh, The Grizzly Adams Show, Pat and I both worked on that show. And if anybody remembers that show, that show preyed on animal lovers. Uh, they had cute baby animals, cute animals on, a cute bear. Everything was just, you know, as cute as you could get, sickeningly cute with the animals. And when we got to the set in Park City, Utah, those animals were living in boxes. The bear that was the lead bear on the show paced incessantly. He, she, it was a female named Bo, or uh, Boo Boo. Bo Bozo, Bozo, and uh, she ran back and forth in this cage nonstop, and not just pacing, running and bouncing off the side. Grizzly bears run and bounce. They bounce off things. And, and I saw her about 10 years later, and I asked if they still had uh, bows, and they said, yeah, we still have her, and they pointed to a cage, and she was still doing the same thing. That was her life. She would do anything for a marshmallow and she would roll over, she would go into the bed, she, would, she, she was a machine. You really don't want a wild animal on a movie set, you want a machine. Uh, then, of course, Ringling Brothers, Barnum & Bailey Circus and the circus industry was going full bore back in those days. And so that's what we walked into. We had no plans of starting a sanctuary. I remember going down to San Francisco Cisco and getting our nonprofit letter, our 501c3, coming back to Galt and, and getting ready to just advocate for these animals because Pat knew behind the scenes what was going on and, and we were tired of having animals in enclosures, big enclosures, small enclosures, and we were finished with it. Little did we know. These were the t first two um, things that we did. First two movies we worked on. Uh, an animal trainer had read Pat's book, a uh, female animal trainer from Hollywood. She came to see Pat, said, you have to do something about these two movies. The people who worked on the movie with the orangutan said uh, that they were 
they had clubs called Buddha clubs. The orangutan was named Buddha. And that they were beating this orangutan over the head with these clubs. And Beastmaster was a bad B movie. And they, that's a black tiger. That's a tiger, in, not a jaguar or a leopard. That's a black tiger that has been dyed black for the movie. And the tiger had a history of respiratory problems under anesthesia. And the dye ate right into his skin and he died a horrible death. Uh, maggots under his skin, his skin was peeling off. So those were the t first two things that we did. We had the, the USDA actually took the man's license away and fined him $15,000. And we thought we were well on our way to straightening out Hollywood. We also worked hard on the circus. Uh, when video cameras came out, I was down at the railroad tracks and at the train tracks and, and at where the trucks unload to videotape uh, the elephants and their treatment. Um, nothing except maybe an orca in captivity is as sad as an elephant in captivity. There is absolutely no way to meet their needs in captivity. There's a spectrum of care. At one end you have big open areas and you, the, you do the best you can. The other end of the spectrum is this uh, elephant so afraid to be hit with the bull hook that the man has, that the trainer has. Uh, that she would stand on her head with a woman posing on top of her. We were very proud when Mother Jones called Pat the uh, number one antagonist of the circus. We framed that one. This is Camba, one of our lions. Uh, she came from a circus in Bolivia. Um, I always like to identify the, the, uh, the, our friends that, are, that appear on the, on the uh, slides. And we thought that it was really important to confront captivity in, on every front. Uh, nobody can convince me that there's a good reason to put an animal in a cage. I think at this point, if we had no animals in cages, we would not allow people to put animals in cages uh, and say that it's educational or it's good for amusement or the kids like it. Um, I just think it's a model that hasn't worked it never will work. Uh, there is no reintroduction of animals that even go from a zoo in the United States or around the world to uh, the wild. There's no plan ever to introduce an elephant to the wild. Every elephant that has ever been born in captivity has lived and died in captivity. And every elephant born from now on will live and die in captivity. This thought of uh, repopulating the, uh, the forest and the savanna with elephants is, is just something to appease the public. There's no way it's ever going to be done. Nobody's ever reintroduced a tiger. Nobody's ever reintroduced lions to a real habitat. No baboons, no gorillas. It's, it just isn't going to happen. If there was a, uh, an endangered animal and this was its habitat right here, do you think we would tear down this building to give the habitat back to the, to the uh, animals? We would never tear anything down. There's gonna, if we don't save it now, if we don't do the right thing now for habitat, then we're gonna lose the animals. But don't put them in captivity and say that you're saving them. I think the worst phrase, <clears throat> I think the worst phrase, and it it's, should have been a good phrase, but I think it was misused, was the endangered species. If we had called uh, the habitat an endangered habitat, we'd be shooting at the right target. What we did was give fly-by-night breeders and big institutions carte blanche to breed tigers, to breed elephants, and say that they're saving the species. Um, while they're saving the species and, and spending $42 million, $55 million on elephant enclosures in zoos, the habitat is shrinking. We're building roads through the habitat. We're separating uh, migratory routes. Um, we're shooting at the wrong target, and we have been for a long time. I think, 
I think we have to change things, and I think we have to change them fast. Uh, we decided we were going to advocate for animals and entertainment, speak out against cruelty. Uh, we've been pretty consistent in that. Um, we wanted to educate officials and the public, and that's hard. Back in the uh, 80s, the only media outlets were ABC, NBC, and CBS. There was no cable, there was no internet, there was no way to get the word out. We did a, a complete show about a circus. I can't really say it because we have, I have a legal restriction, but it, the circus rhymes with Dingling Brothers. <laughs> the whole show on 2020 was about this circus. It was videotape about what they were doing with the, with the elephants. And at the end of the, of the segment, Barbara Walters came on and said, of course, Ringling Brothers would never do anything like this. They, they have their standards and they are concerned about the welfare of the animals and it neutered the whole, the whole uh, piece. So there was no way to get the word out and there was no way to influence the public. Uh, we had AP and UPI and there was, and people didn't want to hear negative stories, especially about a, an industry that, that entertains because ABC was owned by Disney and they're not going to put on a, a bad story without covering it somehow. Um, we also supported le uh, legislation and uh, and Jennifer Fearing is uh, the greatest. I mean, she was, I'm not saying that because I'm afraid of her, but I'm just saying that because <laughs> we worked hard together on the, on the Bullhook ban. Um, she really is, uh, uh, it reminds me a lot of Pat Derby, which is a high compliment. Um, and we wanted to be a resource for other organizations because a lot of other organizations at that time were, were uh, actually using circuses for uh, fundraisers. You know, local humane societies were having a circus come in to do a fundraiser and they thought that was a positive thing. They had no idea that how the animals were treated. So we wanted to be a resource for, for everybody because at that time there was no anti-circus movement. I mean, we were really the first ones to, uh, to know what the problems were and know how to attack them. We knew that we would need a lot of help. This is Alexander, a uh, black leopard that came out of somebody's backyard in Houston. Always a good idea to, it, it's amazing some of the stories uh, where these animals come from. He injured a little girl and, and uh, was taken to the Humane Society in uh, Houston. And they called us and said, please hurry, he's eating his way through to the poodles. He's, <laughs> They had nothing to hold Alexander. Now he has a, he's 17 years old now. He's getting up there and he has a beautiful place. So, so anyway, that's Alexander. We knew we would need veterinarians to help us and we have totally failed. We have no veterinarians. Um, we have very few people. Dr. Mel, that was, some of you know, was a great advocate for animals. He passed away. Um, there, there is a, a, if you're a wildlife veterinarian, the way you make money and have a good career is to go to uh, uh, a zoo, then to a better zoo and a better zoo and a better zoo. Uh, and you get more money, more money. So you don't really want to talk against captivity or breeding in captivity if you, want to, if you want to advance. So it's really hard to get veterinarians to help us. Conservationists, we've done a great job. Cynthia Moss and, and uh, Keith Lindsay, Joyce Poole have really helped us on animals. Uh, we ally ourselves with animal groups. Uh, politicians are tough. Uh, sometimes out of the blue, a Republican will, will make a charge for you and, and they helped quite a bit on, our, on the bullhook ban in California and the media. And attorneys, we have to have attorneys. We knew that from the beginning. Uh, the first thing we did uh, was we got calls from uh, a group called Friends of Mara in San Jose that was uh, trying to save an elephant that was being sold to a circus that was in Mexico. They didn't want her to go. They didn't want her to go out of the country where they couldn't keep track of her. 
they didn't want her to be addressed with a bull hook and chained and so they called us for a plan of action so we said we don't have a place for an elephant but we can help you uh, maybe do some fundraising so you can keep her from from going to a circus and we will look for a place to put her well the friends of Mara uh, wanted no breeding for Mara she was a cull elephant from Kruger. She was born wild in the most nurturing uh, atmospheres that you can have as a, as a, a biological being uh, in a herd of elephants being totally protected and totally loved. Uh, so they wanted her not to be bred because her mother was shot right out from underneath her. No bull hooks and no chains. So we knew we needed a tough negotiator we found a place in Florida that uh, agreed to take Mara with those conditions, the only place in the country that would do it. But we wanted to make sure if anything happened to that group of elephants that, that we had the right of first refusal if, uh, if they started having problems with the group. There were 90 elephants there total. And uh, so Pat Derby, I can't imagine a better team. Pat Derby and Joyce Tischler flew to Florida set the deal with a, a guy who was a soldier of fortune, had killed 57 people in, in wars around the world, and they came back with the agreement that uh, we could ship Mara there with, and feel secure about it, so we flew Mara. This is the, that's guess, that's the animal dealer with the glasses and the beard in the middle. Uh, we went to see Mara occasionally afterwards, but while we were there, we saw number 71. Number 71, they all had a tag around their necks with different numbers. 71 in this picture was five years old, and she was the size she should have been at four and a half months old. So she was stunned. You can tell her stomach is distended. She was, Pat said, we don't have a place to put Mara, but we could take this sick baby, fatten her up, and then bring her back to the group. Well. That didn't happen. They told us, keep the sick one, and you better come and get Mara because she's on her way to a circus in Mexico again. They, uh, they were selling off all the animals, and there was a, uh, they were selling them off for $5,000 a piece, and a broker in North Carolina, or South Carolina, was selling them. So we took Mara, and that was the solidification of our sanctuary life. Once you take two elephants, you have a sanctuary whether you planned it or not. And, and so we, uh, we specialized in elephants for a, a long time, especially with the circus. But if you're a sanctuary, you have to go by these rules. You cannot breed, you cannot sell, you can't have public contact, you can't make them perform, you have to give them lifetime care and excellent uh, veterinary care. So we've worked a long, hard time to make sure that this happens. We have eight elephants now. Uh, there are limitations for sure. Confinement, you have to confine them. I don't, sanctuary sounds great, but there has to be a fence. Space, this is our, our place here with uh, Toka in the foreground and Tika in the back. Uh, the social structure is always hard. We have elephants from five different places, five different countries. Um, a family unit is a bonded unit, but when you put them all together from other places, it's not right, you know, and they know it. Uh, tigers don't live together. We put tigers in groups. We put bears in groups, and elephants are hard to, uh, a lot of times, hard to introduce to each other. So you have Diet isn't the same as it would be if in, in the wild. Activity is different. They sway, they rock, they bob their head. Um, they've spent, a lot of these elephants have spent time chained up, so they didn't have an opportunity to do anything. They didn't even know you could eat the grass when they came. Um, the climate sometimes isn't right. And everything now is a rescue or a sanctuary. This is a place we took 39 tigers from the biggest tiger rescue ever. And it happened in California in this century. Uh, and you can see it says rescue, all the keywords, all the buzzwords that, that people want to support, rescue and sanctuary, nonprofit. 
for retired animals and you can see they're fighting over food that's a, in the center on the top is a carcass of a, of a dead tiger. He had 150 tigers at this place and by the time USDA and Fish and Game got in there, there were 90 dead tigers from starvation. 58 dead babies in the freezer and it was an emergency and so we took them. We do the best we can. It was the hardest thing we've ever done, um, but they all deserve it. We, our feed bill went up $3,000 a week. Uh, I'm vegan. I buy more meat than anybody in the county, and I, I, <clears throat> I'm invited. If you need anybody undercover at a convention, I'm, the, I'm your man. <clears throat> they, uh, yeah, and I have a problem with that. Why is the cow less important than the tiger or the chicken? So the less breeding of these animals in captivity, the less feed animals that are produced for them. And then there's Ben the Bear. Ben the Bear was an ALDF project and probably the hardest day of my life rescuing Ben the Bear. We had to, uh, he lived in a 22 foot long, 11 foot wide concrete bunker with a den box that was solid concrete also. So his, his floor was concrete and that's all he ever felt on his feet or on his body. <clears throat> he, uh, he would chew on the cage and pace back and forth in this roadside zoo. I mean, non-stop pacing back and forth. And you can see spots where he was chewing on the fence. So ALDF and Peter worked together and we had a spot, luckily, for Ben the Bear. We had uh, an order from the judge that said we could get the bear out fast if we could get him out, you know, in a, I think it was two weeks. So bears are the hardest animal to move and, and uh, we kind of got lucky. And FedEx kicked in and, and uh, shipped him. They called it Bear Force One. <laughs> and we flew Ben back and so this is Ben now. And He's, you know, now, now his, instead of square feet, his area is measured in acres. So he's probably the happiest rescue we've ever had. I mean, he went, he, he just acted like he was meant to live here. He knows how to get the acorns out of the trees. He eats little grubs and things around um, in the ground. He dig, they declawed him, but... He still digs things up with his uh, front paws, and he's, he's just the coolest guy. <clears throat> so if you're a sanctuary, you have to confront captivity. You have to. You can't be a sanctuary and join AZA. You can't be a sanctuary and, and cut the corners on, uh, on any of these items here. You have to be strict, and we're about as strict as, as you can be. You also have to fight for the animals. We lead marches in San Francisco for ivory. Uh, there's the California bullhook ban, which I think took down Ringling Brothers. Uh, if you can point to one thing that uh, made them decide not to travel anymore, I think that was it. And Jennifer has a huge, uh, gets a huge credit in that. The Humane Society of the United States and Oakland Zoo were the sponsors on that with us. And we also have conferences where we have hard-hitting speakers and I have friends in the zoo world that think I'm an animal extremist and I'm happy about that. You know, they, they uh, sometimes are, I think I'm getting worse as I, I start dyeing my hair white. <clears throat> and I think, uh, I think, you know, when you, when Pat passed away, I think we upped our, our energy a little bit even more. Uh, it does get, you know, time, you don't have as much time as you think and you have to go fast. So now we still have Mara. She was the first one that we uh, uh, said that we would take. We kept track of her. We've been responsible for her with the help of Joyce for 34 years now, or uh, 20, how old? Well, from the very beginning, so 33 years at, in the sanctuary. And there she is going down the hill. This is her at the lake with uh, her best friend, Tika. And we're, uh, you know, we, we think that, I think anyway, and Paz thinks that in maybe 
five years or 10 years, hopefully not 20 years, we're gonna turn around and, and take a step back and just think that we used to, like a lot of social problems that we've conquered, uh, we used to keep animals in cages for absolutely no reason except entertainment. And I think those days are, are numbered. I think we have to all work together to stop the breeding, that stop the capture, stop the importation, let the animals here die off of attrition. Then we can pull up the fences and turn our property back over to the animals that lived there before. Thanks. <clears throat> Well, that's a, a tough act to follow there. Um, thank you, everyone, for still being here. I know it's at the end of the day. Um, I want to also use the podium to give a shout out to our previous panelists um, and thank them, <clears throat> those women, for being brave and speaking the truths and stories that they um, that they told today. And I just want to say on a sort of personal level to them and to all of us in this room, as a woman CEO in this field um, and executive director, um, you gave me a lot to think about. And um, I, got, I got a little weepy, which I don't, I don't like doing that, um, hearing your stories. Um, but I, there's a story that I came to mind immediately when, um, when the previous panel was, was going on about um, knowing, a, knowing a story of something happening in our industry that I, I will go home and think um, long and hard about knowing that and probably not doing the right thing personally in that moment. So I just want to thank those people again and maybe um, give them a round of applause for giving us that to think about. So uh, back to the topic at hand. Um, I'm going to talk about primate sanctuaries and some of the partnerships that have been successful in getting primate residents into sanctuaries. And um, I think it builds nicely on what Ed was just talking about um, in that um, sanctuaries really are more than, than just um, providing care, and they have to be. So a little bit of background on me. Um, as you heard already, but I'll just reiterate it so it's fresh in your minds, I've been working with, with or for chimpanzees since 1997. So I met Washo. She was the, the chimpanzee who spoke sign language fell in love with her. Um, she roped me into this industry. I really, in this community and this movement, um, I blame slash thank her um, for staying in this world and for exposing me to all of these ideas that I never really had been exposed to um, in my life prior to meeting a chimpanzee. Um, she roped me in and my first career move after grad school and meeting her was working undercover. And um, I don't think that Pat knew who I was, but when I was working undercover in the entertainment um, industry, working for a chimpanzee trainer, um, Pat was part of the group of advisors um, that was working on the project, looking at uh, 20, 30 years later, what were the stories? Um, are they, were they still the same, those stories that you heard Ed talk about in terms of primates and entertainment? Um, were those things still happening? So this was in 2001, 2002, and Pat was advising. And I never got to really thank her or meet her, although I remember being at one of the pause conferences when I was working undercover um, and not being able to really say what I was doing. But I, I think that she knew me as Miss X because it was supposed to be a secret who I was or what I was doing exactly. Um, but I remember um, just being in awe of her. And unfortunately, um, confirming that a lot of those stories were, were still still true 20 or 30 years later. Um, law school, after working undercover, a um, little bit of a shift. I, I kind of um, bob and weave in my career and continue to to this day. Um, after law school, I started, or I was a part of a group that started and ran Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest, which is a neighbor to your north in Washington state. Um, I think Ali earlier when she was talking said that when she gets mad she starts programs. I, I see now about myself that um, when I get mad I start sanctuaries. So I have um, started to, um, for, in the interest of, of my husband not divorcing me, I swear I will not start anymore. Um, but uh, so after ch I left Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest, I worked with NAPSA, which is the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance. This will come back in as I'm talking today. Um, 
alliance building is a real theme and working together. And I love being in these conferences where there are so many diverse people working together and sharing ideas. I really think that working together is the way forward. Um, NAPSA was a, is an alliance of, of sanctuaries started by seven directors of sanctuaries themselves aimed at really professionalizing the sanctuary community and helping to figure out how do we have that conversation with the public. So those tiger rescues uh, that end up with all those dead babies and, and horribly suffering um, residents, how do, we, how, the, how do we help the public see that the true sanctuaries, the, the actual sanctuaries, are different than those rescues? Um, so that was a big part of our work with NAPSA. Um, and then Project Chimps, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, towards the end, um, is a, a, the other sanctuary that I started um, and was focused on chimpanzees used in research, is focused on chimpanzees used in research. Hopefully that will be the last chimpanzee sanctuary that ever has to be built, um, thanks to the work, the good work of this movement um, around chimpanzee issues. Um, the goal of this panel, um, and I think the description in your materials, is something about how sanctuaries go beyond sort of that obvious care. And and, you know, I think we think of, of, of sanctuaries as kind of the happy endings and the good stuff, right? Because you get to play with chimps or watch elephants roam in the fields and it's so rewarding and amazing. But it really is much more than that. And if you take kind of a step back and think about why are these sanctuaries needed and how do the residents get there and what roles do sanctuaries need to play or can play in stemming the tide from these industries that are using these animals into sanctuary. Um, so that's what I'm gonna just talk about a little bit more. Um, there's sometimes this tension, which I just sort of like to call out tension when I, I feel it. I think it's better than leaving the elephant in the room or whatever um, appropriate phrase <laughs> we have here. Um, between animal protection groups or animal protection movements and sanctuaries or this sort of lack of vision or clarity around what are the roles here. So are, are the animal protection folks just going and getting the animals and the sanctuaries are opening their doors and providing care? Um, or is it more complex than that? And obviously you know that I'm gonna say it is more complex than that. Um, so I've been in both roles. I've been an advocate, I'm trained as a lawyer, although I have not practiced. Um, and I have run sanctuaries and provided care. So I like to think that I can bridge that gap and talk about kind of both sides of that tension. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, about some of the really successful coalitions and partnerships that have resulted in happy endings. Um, a, lot of, a lot of primates getting out of industries that use them and into the good stuff, so into the sanctuaries. Um, there, I, I made this colorful little graphic um, to, to kind of illustrate how there's this common, common theme there, right? And, um, and you could put animal protection in the middle there as well. But uh, especially for primates, coming out of the pet trade, coming out of entertainment, coming out of research, all of those industries need sanctuaries. Those industries have sort of time-limited um, windows and um, for the pet trade and the entertainment trade, that is the first couple years of a, of a pet primate um, or a, an entertainer. Um, they, they're only good to that industry or that use for a couple years. A chimpanzee who's cute and snuggly and tiny as a baby turns into a full-grown chimpanzee. And you all have heard the stories of the power and, um, and possibility of a full-grown chimpanzee and what, what can happen in a human home or in an, on a set, for example, if you have a liability like that. So those animals need sanctuaries. Ultimately, they're gonna, the lucky ones, but generally now all of them do, they're gonna come to sanctuaries. They need these sanctuaries. Same with the research industry. It's been a longer story um, and a longer window where chimpanzees especially have been used in research. And um, thanks to a whole lot of amazing work in this field, we can say now that chimpanzees, not their other primate siblings, there's a whole lot of work to do in that regard, um, but chimpanzees in particular, they're not really used in, in invasive research anymore. There was this incredible groundswell of public support, of policymaker support, and of government support saying we don't need them in research anymore. Whether that was for ethics or financial reasons or who cares, right? There was a decision that, that created this change and the research community really needed sanctuaries to step in and, and provide care. I'm totally not looking at my notes. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about those industries that need um, 
that need sanctuaries. These pictures that I have up are all, uh, are all chimpanzees who are now in sanctuary. So it's the sad before picture, um, but just know in the back of your mind that these, um, these residents have been rescued. Um, these two in particular ended up in sanctuary um, earlier than maybe some pets do. The woman who had them in her living room, that's her living room where she had those um, cages, they would have busted out of those cages in not too long. Um, they were small and compliant then, but they weren't going to be for very long. She put them in her car with her gun and drove from where she was in Montana to Florida and showed up at the doorstep of a sanctuary and said, you must take these animals and didn't leave until they did. So uh, in terms of how do animals get into sanctuaries, how do chimpanzees get into sanctuaries, that's one story. Entertainment, um, I mentioned that I had worked undercover um, many moons ago now. Um, this is the compound where I worked. Those are baby chimpanzees who are living in, uh, on a training compound in Malibu. Thankfully now they're living on a sanctuary island in Florida. Thanks um, in part to some of the people in this room. So they went from entertainment to sanctuary. And then research. Um, undercover, there's sort of a theme in, in some of my work and my thinking about animals getting into sanctuaries and the different kind of villages that it takes with everybody kind of chipping away at these issues. Um, this facility it was, is called, was called the Buckshire Corporation. Um, in Pennsylvania, and they had been the subject of an undercover investigation many years earlier um, that revealed all kinds of horrible stories about chimpanzees and other animals who were in their care. Um, many of the chimpanzees got out, but seven were left in this basement. And um, these chimpanzees now live at Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest. I didn't show you one with their faces, but they were sad, pitiful um, chimps in cages pictures. Um, many years after that undercover investigation. So I think a lot about the role of undercover investigations in what we do. I know it's a big issue in um, farm, factory farm issues as well. Um, it, it resulted in the rescue of some of the animals right away. 10 or more years later, these chimpanzees were rescued. Um, and that's still in the ether, right? That, that they were investigated and those stories were told by an undercover investigator. So that gives you the, sort of the flavor of where um, sanctuary residents are coming from in terms of primates. I want to talk, as I mentioned, um, I'm a really big believer in building alliances. Um, and I think the, the, some of the best work happens when you are able to put aside sort of the marketing and the fundraising and the money side of those, which are very important pressures for nonprofits, of course. When you put a whole bunch of people in a room, smart, caring, passionate people, um, and you allow them to just think about and sift through what are the important issues here and how do we solve these problems. Um, I think that's where you get some of your best stuff happening in this movement. So I wanted to talk just a little bit more about that. Um, I've always heard that phrase, we're stronger together than we are alone. I meant to add the um, attribution, and I can't remember the guy's full name, but I remember his nickname was Sweetness. He was a football player um, known as some, somebody... Walter Payton, there we go. <laughs> um, Walter Sweetness Payton said that, and I, I really believe in this, and I want to just talk a little bit about some of the alliances that have created really good stuff for sanctuary. So the Chimpanzee Collaboratory was the, the um, coalition that was responsible for the undercover work that I mentioned. Pat was a part of it, Paws was a part of it, ALDF was a part of it. Um, it was a, a coalition of scientists, um, researchers, public policy experts, and um, they put their mind, they put some funding together, they had some meetings, um, it also included sanctuary experts, um, and they, they talked about together what can we do, what can we break off in this large scheme of, or this large world of all of these issues related to chimpanzees in particular, what issues can we work together on? And I really believe that the work that they did on chimpanzees and entertainment, building on the work that many, brave, many braver than me, like Pat, um, came before us, did for us, I, I really believe that the modern, pub, you know, current conversation about chimpanzees and entertainment gained real traction thanks to this alliance of organizations 
working on this one issue. And I, I really genuinely believe that we can say that we don't see chimps in movies anymore, we don't see them in greeting cards. If we do, there's an instant public outcry. And I really think we have that chimpanzee collaboratory to thank for that. Um, I think it's one of those alliances that, although it was, it was somewhat short-lived, that's the other thing I always want to say about alliances, is they don't have to be a nonprofit that lasts forever. It was sort of a, a five-year project that did incredible things, and then it, it wasn't working very well anymore, and it ended, and that was fine. Um, I think it was responsible for all kinds of good stuff. Um, NAPSA, I've already talked about, is the Alliance of Primate Sanctuaries. Um, I really believe that NAPSA played a key role in ending the use of chimps in research, as I mentioned. We were seven sanctuary directors that saw this issue on the horizon of chimpanzees in research. And when I, was, when I first met Washoe and I was a grad student, we were doing public conversation about, or public um, visitation about uh, the chimps who speak sign language. People would come and want to learn about the chimps. I remember part of the little spiel that you had to do as the grad student in front of this group of people was, we will never get chimpanzees out of research. We will, and that was, that was 20 years ago, 1997. We will um, maybe work on entertainment and the pet industry. Those are real uh, small numbers. Those are things that we work on. We will never get those 1,200 chimps out of research. But you know what? We did. And it's amazing to be able to say that we did. I don't take credit for that, but I'm really proud to be able to say that we, we did that. And um, on top of the fact that we didn't think we ever would. And I really believe that a, a big part of that conversation at the public level and with, at, with the policymakers um, is thanks in part to these sanctuaries figuring out that they needed to work together. And we are all in the animal, or maybe not all of us, but many of us are in the animal protection field. We know that it's not always easy to work with each other, right? Like we all are passionate people, we have big ideas, we don't always agree. Um, no difference in the sanctuary world there either. But we locked arms, we professionalized our standards, we looked at what are the standards of care that we're providing, what do we need to do so that we're all at a certain level, and not a baseline level, but a stretch level, a gold standard level of care. And we partnered with animal protection and animal rights groups to, have, to drive these conversations and to speak with the authority of the 600 residents that we had in our care. And I, I really believe that, that, that building that alliance and having the support of the animal protection community and working together and sending that message out as a unified voice is responsible for the fact that we can clap now and say that, that chimps don't belong in research anymore and really aren't found in research anymore. Um, and then finally, I'll, the other one, the last logo there is um, GFAS, the Global Federation of um, Animal Sanctuaries. And again, it provided an opportunity it's an accrediting body. It's uh, removed from um, removed from the sanctuaries themselves. It pro it provides again a level of st a standards of care that help the public identify what's a real sanctuary and what's a backyard breeder or rescue, like you saw in Ed's presentation. Um, and again, I really think that that has helped drive the conversation and help people see we, we, maybe there are some of us who are crazy. I, I count myself amongst the crazy people often. Um, but these sanctuaries are professionals and they're businesses that are being run professionally and they are providing a top-notch care and the public needs to know the difference. And GFAS has been um, great in, in helping drive that public conversation as well. So these coalitions, um, you know, were responsible for really great progress for primates in part because they had sanctuaries in the room. All of, the, all of those organizations and coalitions that I've been talking about had sanctuaries in the room. I wanna talk just a little bit about sort of the cross-industry partnerships that sanctuaries have initiated and have used with great success in terms of getting residents into their, um, their, into their doors, through their doors. Um, sometimes pet owners, you know, putting aside the alliances and the, the partnerships, sometimes someone who has a pet, like those pets you saw earlier, they know they're in over their heads. They know it's maybe a not popular issue. They may have been attacked or criticized publicly or privately by their friends. Often, somewhere in there, they may be misguided, but they know the right thing. I, I really believe that. And very often, and there have been really successful stories, um, with Save the Chimps and with the Center for Great Apes, where a pet owner will approach the sanctuary directly and say, 
I'm in over my head, can you please take this, this chimpanzee who I have in my living room? Um, they, they probably don't want to partner with PETA, right, or, um, or ALDF or anyone else. So there's a real role for those big partnerships. There's also a real, there's a lot to be said for the sanctuaries just going ahead and making these relationships and creating these partnerships on their own. So I think it's a balance. Um, sometimes it takes a village. Um, I always like to talk about the Colson Foundation when, um, when I think about uh, people chipping away and everyone doing their part. The Colston Foundation was a notorious facility that was um, ultimately shut down amidst all kinds of um, reports of cruelty and fraud that was breeding and selling chimpanzees for research and for the pet and entertainment industry. So many organizations, I'm sure many of you in this room worked on these campaign, this campaign and these issues, chipped away at the Colston Foundation until, uh, and sort of, pushed it to the point, or pushed it past the point of bankruptcy. And that resulted, those, all those little everybody doing their own thing moments, not a broad coalition necessarily, but those little moments of everyone doing their own thing resulted in what is now called Save the Chimps being able to come in and take over and rescue 300 chimpanzees who are living in horrible conditions. Um, another, another way that we have partnered, um, again, sort of on the, on the quieter side, is when an entertainer wants to retire. Um, sometimes these entertainers, thankfully there are almost none of them left. Um, they want to retire. Again, they don't want to partner with PETA. They've already been attacked. They've gotten all the action alerts that all of the wonderful people in this room, myself included, have pushed out there into the world. They quietly go, and there are some members of the sanctuary community that work really hard to keep those relationships with those sort of strange bedfellows. You wouldn't think that a, a sanctuary would work hard to, to create those relationships, but, but we do because we can get the door open when uh, uh, another person might not be able to. So Center for Great Apes has retired a whole host of former um, entertainment chimps and orangutans. It's the only sanctuary for orangutans in the US. I think maybe even it was, I, I can't remember if Patty was involved with Clyde or not, but there are some incredible orangutan stories there as well. Um, they also have Bubbles, the chimpanzee, um, who you may, who may recall um, was, um, Michael Jackson's chimp. So a lot of quiet partnerships there happening too. And then finally, I'll just talk um, briefly about Project Chimps, which is my most recent chimp project. Um, we were able to partner with the University of Louisiana, the New Iberia Research Center, <clears throat> to negotiate an agreement with them to retire all of their chimpanzees. And this was because of that groundswell of public support, I think. Um, there was a, it was because of many things. That was one of the reasons. Um, there was uh, some government objectives set in terms of funding. It was clear that um, although the government would no longer fund public, publicly owned chimpanzees, that the chimpanzees who are in private facilities like this one were also going to be losing out on their funding. That's a big liability for an organization. It was a win-win. They wanted to retire. They wanted to get out of it. Um, I was uh, I sort of didn't think that I was going to start another sanctuary when I did that, but I, they reached out, I met with them, they said, we want to get out of it, we want to partner with you, we want, to, we, we want you to come in the front door and shake our hands, we want to meet with you and we want to partner with you. And I took a little heat for that because they were, um, they had been researched by an undercover investigation as well, they were beat up really badly in the press over that, and they were really gun shy, they were really nervous, I kept thinking that sort of like, clowns or um, I don't know who were going to jump out of the closets when we were meeting because it just it seemed like they were so nervous about working with the sanctuary and um, I just didn't think it was going to happen but it did and we we approached it we partnered with them and that's that's when I say we took heat we we shook their hands and we thanked them publicly and we used the word retire we didn't say rescue um, although I'll say it now, <laughs> um, but we, we partner with them to retire their 220 chimps. And good or bad, strange bedfellows or not, all of those individuals who I'm talking about, they're in sanctuaries now because of this work. And um, you know, if you have to take a little bit of heat, sometimes I feel like the, the cost-benefit analysis needs to weigh in the lives of these animals. If we hadn't taken this deal and negotiated with them, they probably would well, most of them are still sitting there, but they're in the process of moving to North Georgia. Um, 22 have made it out already, and the rest um, will come. So 
uh, sort of end of the day, end of our talk. Um, I'm really hoping that we can have some good Q&A, although I'm sure everyone is sleepy um, and ready for dinner or cocktails or, or both. Um, but uh, I'll just close by saying I think everyone's doing their part, and I think we have to celebrate that. And um, when we hear sort of tension or shouldn't have done it this way or shouldn't have done it that way, I, I really want to make the pitch that, that we need to get rid of that sort of attitude in our world. Everyone's doing their part. Everyone's doing good stuff. We're all doing it for these amazing beings. Um, and, um, and keep up the good work. We will now open for Q&A. So if you wanted to line up and ask Ed and Sarah some pressing questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just had a quick question for Ed. When I watch movies, I always look for the American Humane logo at the end when there's animals in it. I'm just wondering if you're in touch with the business enough still whether that means something or whether it's window dressing. <clears throat> well, I, could, I couldn't hear the very end of that, but I... Window dressing. Mm -hmm. window dressing. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> window dressing. Yeah, it's, um, that's the reason we are uh, an organization right now. In, uh, in the 80s, <clears throat> the president of the Hollywood Office of uh, the American Humane Association, after those two incidents where uh, they were using the Buddha clubs on, on the orangutan and the tiger that was dyed black for the movie, her comment was, what you do in your backyard really is not our business. And so we thought, well, we, so it has to be somebody's business, and that's why we form PAWS. But that, that organization should never say anything about no animal was harmed in the making of the movie. Keeping an animal in a cage, a wild animal in a cage, is cruelty enough. Yet the, the regulations in California, because of the movie industry and the American Humane Association, are so minimal. The, for a black bear who roams tens of miles, you know, square miles uh, in the wild, 300 square feet, 10 feet by 30 feet is the regulation for a black bear. For two black bear, it's 450 square feet. For an elephant, this is even today. For an elephant, you can, because of Hollywood and circuses, you can keep an elephant on a chain for 19 hours a day. And for five hours a day, you have to put it into a 1,500 square foot area. And that satisfies the regulation. Uh, for bobcats, it's 80 square feet. I mean, these are tiny, tiny spaces. A black bear will live 25 or 30 years in captivity. and we cannot get it changed. I'm on a committee. In fact, we, we had a bill passed in 86, uh, AB 1620, that um, set a committee to set the standards and advise the director of Fish and Game in California. And what they, you know, we were new at this and we didn't realize they were going to overload it with Hollywood people because the Hollywood, um, you know, industry runs the state, especially the southern part of the state. You don't do anything uh, to to uh, inhibit the uh, the business down there. And also, the Teamsters represent Hollywood animal trainers, so that's another hard nut to to crack. So we cannot get the uh, regulations bigger. And the American Humane Association is one of the biggest obstacles we have. I, I, just, hope, I hope they're not here. <laughs> no, actually, I don't, I don't care if they're here. <laughs> I think the other thing from, the, from my experience working undercover that I learned about the AHA was that they don't actually claim, although it, you know, you look, everybody looks for that stamp at the end if you're a caring person, right? But they don't claim and they don't have the authority or the um, sort of purview to, to look at anything that happens that's not on the set. So it, it's... What I saw with chimpanzee training, the, oh, I lost my, <laughs> my voice. Um, the, the chimps were, were brutally treated on the compounds so that they could go to the set, they would perform and comply with the trainers on, on set. So the monitor on set from the AHA may very well not have seen anything. I agree that just them being there is cruel as a starting point but they may not have seen any of that cruelty that's occurring behind the scenes. 
And it's, it's sort of giving an opportunity for all these trainers and all these horrible things to happen behind the scenes. It's, it's blessing it, basically. Thanks. Thank you. This has to do with the, the legitimacy of uh, some of these organizations, these chari so-called charitable organizations. I'm besieged with mailings from various animal charities, including uh, so-called tiger rescue groups. In fact, I just the other day I got a calendar from, I don't know the name of it, but maybe it was Tiger Woods or something. I, uh, what, what, what am I, what, what, how, how should I interpret, uh, are these, do you know of how that they're promoting themselves, some of these uh, groups, and are they legitimate, are they well, hoarding? I, I'd say like, like Sarah said, um, I would look for the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, GFAS. Okay. If, if they can meet the GFAS uh, w um, standards, uh, which are really tough, tougher than AZA standards, but the Zoo Association, uh, I would say they're fine. Okay. Um, but most, most of these places are not. And I, it's not to say that if there might be somebody who has a sanctuary that's not legitimate outside of the GFAS group, but but, you know, j just this year we've taken eight tigers <clears throat> from a place that was breeding tigers. And you can breed a female tiger twice a year easily and, and take the cubs away and do pictures. That's the new industry now. Do pictures with the public for 50 or $100 each cash money. And those tigers between the ages of maybe uh, almost a month to about four months are handleable. So you can do that. After that, they're too dangerous, and they put them in a cage, and that's it. We've taken eight tigers this year from those places. It's the biggest problem there is right now in, in the U.S. So if the, if the mailing is legitimate, it would have GFAS G stamped on the mailing, maybe? Or do I have to do independent investigation and it, contact GFAS? You should, you should always do an independent investigation before you, you yeah. vote worth your dollars, I would say. I think the GFAS stamp is a good sign. And what I didn't say when I was talking about it was they look not only at the animal care standards, but the other, the business and nonprofit side of things as well, which is really important and not always talked about. You can be a really caring, wonderful, you know, lovely animal lover, or even expert in your species or, or the species that you're caring for, but not know how to run a business. And you can run into those same cruelty and neglect issues. Um, I don't know that GFES is like the only um, you know, the only way to know that it's legitimate, definitely do not send money to anyone who sends you mail until you do your own research. Google them, uh, look at, you know, the, the charity ratings and things like that. You'll, you'll find stories um, if, you're, if you're looking. But don't let them uh, take advantage of you. I, I would say most places with tigers in the U.S. are not legitimate, <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, they're, if, if we had 500 places for tigers right now, we would fill them up. It's, it's uh, an epidemic, it's out of control. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Natalie Barefoot. I'm executive director of Set Law. Set is short for cetacean, which means whales, dolphins, and porpoises. It gives you a little perspective of where I'm coming from. Um, Mr. Stewart, you had mentioned that you decided no public contact with your sanctuaries. So I ask the, the both of you, how did you contemplate public uh, how that plays out, actually, volunteer-wise and, and, and having people come to the sanctuary, how you came to make, make that decision and why, and then as a, a follow-up into that, um, how do you feel about public contact, manage distant contact, particularly from a purpose of education and also the very pragmatic financial um, problems and, and, and struggles that a lot of these places uh, deal with? And then lastly, taking all of that into the wild, if you have any thoughts on um, public contact in the wild, such as safaris or ecotourism in, in Antarctica, or in my case, well-regulated, sometimes <clears throat> whale washing. Can I just ask, when you say contact, I'm assuming you mean something broader than physical contact, or are you talking about touching? Well, and that's why I'm asking you, because it did say no public contact, so just understanding what that is. Well, um, well we're, we talk about physical contact. We have 
We have days, um, probably five days a year, where we allow public to come in and v look at what we do from a distance, keep them totally away from the animals. Uh, so, def I mean, public contact with the animals that we have might not be a good thing anyway. It, you know, it would be a, a dangerous and an insurance risk for one thing. I don't think it does the animal any good. I think that's why we we came up with that a uh, long time ago that if it didn't do the animal any good, we don't, you know, just to have a person have the experience of feeding an elephant or being close to a tiger or any, anything like that is irrelevant to us. But, and I think, I think um, just captivity in general with the public, you know, it, it teaches disrespect, you know, just overall, and I, I tell people that at our open houses. I, I say, if there was no fence, you know, it, it, we have, occasionally we have school groups, not very often. And I always tell the kids that if there was no fence, this would be a totally different tour w with this tiger. You know, just because there's a, we treat the animals here like there is no fence. In India, there's no fence, and the kids in India that live in tiger habitat have complete respect for those animals. <clears throat> if, if, they go to a, if they go to a zoo, you can turn your back, you can get next to the glass and, have, and tease a, an apex predator. It, you just remove the glass one day and, and see how many people are, are teasing the animals. I just think it's disrespectful to... to uh, it, we just teach disrespect, disrespect by uh, letting public see animals behind fences and, and saying that it's okay. We, we have it, and I tell people that it's not okay. It really isn't okay that they're behind a fence, but that's, that's their lot in life. You know, we, we do the best we can for them. Um, I think it's a, it's a good question, and in the, in the chimp sanctuary world in particular, it's starting to be a conversation to kind of be more transparent about that issue because there have been times where people would, organizations would say, and this goes to, back to that professionalizing that I was talking about, well, we don't allow public visitation, but we allow volunteers. And, you know, you come volunteer for the day and you can see this individual. Or, um, you know, an, an unfortunate reality, reality of non, the nonprofit world, you make a big enough donation and you can come see. And that lens is so messed up, right? If we're, if we're a sanctuary, if we're gonna say we're a true sanctuary, we should be putting the needs of the residents first and their, their proximate needs, like their need to be able to hide from us or have privacy or not have people knocking on the glass or looking at them. Um, so I think there's, in the chimp sanctuary community at least, there's been a conversation about how can we sort of honor the desire for people to want to see up close or connect with these individuals who are so similar to us without imposing on their day? So there are some creative solutions like webcams, or which there are privacy issues there too, but it's less invasive for them if there's a webcam, right, that people can be watching. If they're not in, you're, not in your face, you're not in their faces. There are ways to view from afar. There are some sanctuaries that are doing a really good job of kind of setting up bird blinds, and so you can observe the residents in their kind of natural, environment, natural sanctuary environment from afar. Um, so it's imperfect still, and it's a struggle really because we want our supporters to connect with our residents, and we need to find ways to do that without imposing on them. Um, and then in terms of your last question, you know, the free living counterparts, I think that, that they go together because another thing that at least the chimp and primate sanctuaries talk about is how do we build empathy for the, the free living counterparts? And when there are sanctuaries in those countries, so there are captive chimpanzees, for example, in West Africa, where they belong, although they don't, you know, they don't belong in a sanctuary, they belong free living. Um, how do we kind of help our supporters make the connection between those needs and the issues that they're facing in the wild and protecting them where they belong? Because just like Ed said, we can do the best we can for them in captivity in a sanctuary, but we're never, ever going to meet their needs. So it's, that's not an answer, but it's something that we definitely talk about and think about, and uh, we always are sort of looking for more ideas about how to make those connections while putting the needs of the residents first. <clears throat> 
Thanks. I'm a, I'm a board member of GFAS, so I wanted to thank both of you for, for speaking well of our organization. You, you of can pay us later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, that was, a, that was a nice PSA from both of you, so I appreciate it. So, but we, uh, and, 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 and simply want to say that really every word both of you said about our, our combined movement is really spot on. And, and so from the, the GFAS end, our, as you said, and Sarah, you spoke to this, our, uh, our standards are about animal care, of course, and about human safety and also about sustainability, financial reserves, succession planning, governance, and all the rest. And, and really, just as one example, there are many of the scope of the problem we've been talking about. Tigers a lot, and, and one of my colleagues on the board uh, is a philanthropist who um, founded Tigers in America. And so there are approximately 3,200 tigers in the wild, um, in the world. And there are over 7,000 tigers in America, the preponderance of, of whom is, as you, as you well know, and you both know, are, are in terrible circumstance. Um, so that's just one important species that speaks to the scope of the problem. If anybody want to talk about GFAS, I'm happy to chat offline a while. So thank you again for talking about my, uh, my organization. I appreciate it. So, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And, and, and you, you, men you mentioned Tigers in America, and, and uh, that organization has taken a business I've always thought we needed a business-like approach to some of it, you know, because every time we go anywhere, you know, you're emotional and you're right. You know, we, I mean, we're right, but we are emotional sometimes. And you know, when we're describing situations as bad as we see, you know, you have to be emotional. So Tigers in America, you might look it up, uh, Google it. It's a fairly new organization that has a business-like approach to solving the problem of all the tiger breeding in, in uh, the U.S., which is absolutely disgraceful that it's happening now. So you might give them a, a look. Hi. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the, the last question um, that Natalie had about uh, visitors coming to sanctuaries. Um, as someone who is engaged in uh, developing the first uh, seaside sanctuary for whales and dolphins, I can tell you that uh, it's a little bit different. In order to get a permit from the, uh, according to the Marine Mammal Protection Act, you have to either say that your facility is a research facility or a public display facility. And that means certain things. So for instance, if we're public display, it's not enough to say, well, we're gonna put underwater cameras and then pipe the video into a, a room. Actual visitors, actual human beings have to lay eyes on the animals. So, um, and that doesn't mean that they have to be close, and there's ways of dealing with that. But depending upon the kind of sanctuary and the kind of animal, you know, sometimes the, reg the regulations force you to make a choice, and you try to make the choice that you feel is the least invasive for the animals. Right. Well, well with us, I mean, ours was no public contact, you know, with no no getting close, no touching, no, you know, I mean, pretty much blatant uh, uh, violation of their space. Uh, no feeding elephants, no going down to the river and washing the elephant, and that, that kind of thing. In fact, as far as money goes, our, one of our biggest donors always wanted to get close to the elephants, and we just couldn't allow it. And I look on uh, social media, and they're hugging an elephant in Thailand. Mm. because they just wanted to hug an elephant. And that's their prerogative, but, but we didn't relax our, our, uh, our rules for anybody. No, I don't think you, you can. I mean, we're, we're looking at things like long-distance viewing, <laughs> you know, yeah. so the animals don't even know yeah, the I think there's, are there. I think there's a way to set up a, a situation, like in blinds or a, a long way away, mm -hmm. uh, or if, you know, if you think you might be affecting them in any way. Uh, I mean, I know for a fact, I just, I, I don't want our special events person to hear this, but I hate open houses. <laughs> I hate it when anybody comes in, construction crews, because it, it changes the animal's behavior. The elephants are up on top of the hill, and yeah. they're grazing, and they're under the trees, and somebody shows up, and they come right to the fence and beg for food. And I, I just don't 
like that. I'm pretty protective of of their day and uh, I get that. Yeah. but you know it's it's something that we do four or five times a year yep. another thing with um, chimps that I'll mention in terms of visiting is um, chimps in particular are so much like us and experience the world so much like us that I've seen many times a chimp be really enriched by a visitor and if it's done well and with a guide and with someone interpreting what's happening and you know, obviously safely, if, if there's any contact, it's not safe and it's not a sanctuary as far as I'm concerned. But um, there are some creative solutions. I, I reviewed a proposal for a sort of FaceTime interaction between chimps and between humans and chimps in, you know, who are a world away. Um, but the chimps can be really enriched by that and they can make new friends that way and they can have something different in their day, a big part of, of primate sanctuary and sanctuary in general is enriching the lives of these residents who we've taken on the responsibility for and we can't meet their needs because they're not roaming miles and miles a day or looking for food all day so we need other puzzles for them and sometimes some of them if they're very human oriented especially we you know we found if they were in the pet or entertainment field where they were raised by humans some of them really want that and um and i think that's okay too as long as they're making the choice so they ha they can go hide and stay away from facetime if they hate that device but if they want to interact with it then you know why not give them the choice thank you are there any other questions? I have one question that comes purely out of ignorance. You've mentioned tiger breeding in the United States. How much of that is done for canned hunting? Uh, tigers to canned hunts? Yes. Um, tigers in canned hunts are totally illegal. That's, that's yes. one reason. We had a, a tiger incident in California where they were shooting tigers in, in canned hunts, and we paused, had a bill passed in probably the early 90s that outlawed canned hunts. It's an endangered species, so you couldn't shoot it in a canned hunt, although I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. I mean, it, it's tigers breed. So, you, you know, you think of an endangered animal being hard to breed. If you put tigers in an enclosure and they get along, they're going to breed 30 times a day. Somebody is going to have a baby. And <clears throat> it's almost impossible to stop them from breeding if they're together. And that's one of the other problems. They, they get a litter of four or five, some, or a group, a family, and they let them interbreed and, and inbreed. You know, for generation after generation after generation, they, they have flat noses. They're, you know, white tigers are, are not a natural color phase of a, of a tiger. We've been sold the white tiger thing for years, since the 60s, and it's uh, unethical to breed white tigers, but th th these guys don't care. I mean, they, they're they making cash. One guy said he was making $6,500 cash a weekend just by doing pictures with baby tigers. So it's... Uh, Right now, we have uh, the, a group of tiger sanctuaries or sanctuaries that have tigers that are getting together and sponsoring some legislation to make it illegal or make it harder to, for these places to exist. But that, uh, for probably 30 years, we spent most of our time on elephants, and now we're spending most of our time on tigers because it's such a huge problem. Any other questions? Okay, so I have to ask Sarah something. When um, Margie unfortunately had to cancel due to the fires, Sarah brought up a story about a chimpanzee rescue with the fire, and I was wondering if she would share that story during the remainder of our time. Sure. Um, <laughs> so I was executive director of Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest when the Taylor Bridge fire hit in Washington State. If you're local, you may remember it from um, a number of years ago. Uh, six or seven years ago. Um, it started, it was a wildfire that grew to, I think, hundreds of thousands of acres in Washington state, and it started less than a mile from the sanctuary. And uh, we had seven chimpanzees. We had no, no means of evacuating them at, at that time. Um, and, and I say that in a number of, with a number of meetings. One, we didn't have a truck that could haul all of them away um, if we wanted to evacuate. But much more relevant, it started just down the road and was on our property within minutes. So even if we had wanted to 
dart every single chimpanzee, load them into a cage, and load them onto a truck, which we did not have. Um, we couldn't have. So um, the wildfire blew through, r flew, burned through um, the property really fast. And I was just telling Ed earlier that I learned everything that I never wanted to know about firefighting through that experience because, um, you know, those pictures that you see on the news with all of these amazing firefighters who are showing up in California and elsewhere, those, those men and women didn't show up at our sanctuary until a few days later because um, you know, it takes time to call them all in. Our local fire department was amazing. They were, they were there as soon as they could get there. They thought of us instantly. And again, that's sort of back to the relationship building that I was talking about earlier. They showed up because we invited them out long before there was ever an issue and we made friends with them and they thought of us. And I still have chills thinking of the, um, seeing the fire trucks just sort of creating this fortress around the building. Um, to protect us. And if you haven't experienced a wildfire, you might not know that it, it goes through really fast and fire looks for the easiest source of fuel, so it'll do the grass and the trees that are dry. Um, we, we didn't experience much damage to any um, structures on our property. It burned our trees, um, it burned a little bit of our fence um, and a corner of the house on the property. But what I didn't know, and I learned through that process, was it continues to burn underground for days and weeks. So it, it goes down into the roots of those trees that, that fuel the fire. And seemingly randomly, the fire just sort of erupts out of nowhere. And you have to go um, stomp it out and use these tools. And we were fortunate to have a um, volunteer who was also a firefighter who taught us all of these skills. And we had a very small staff, uh, only seven chimpanzees and maybe six, five or six staff and a whole bunch of volunteers, and we had to do around the clock, 24-hour fire watch, because you never knew when one would erupt on the property. So it was pretty crazy. It's another thing that GFAS pushes sanctuaries to do, is talk about disaster planning. Um, sometimes people are critical of, of an experience. I just experienced the hurricane in Florida recently. Um, you know, why didn't you plan for that? Um, or why would you put a sanctuary where there might be wildfires? Everywhere you look, everywhere there's a sanctuary, everywhere in the United States and probably in the world, there's some sort of natural disaster potential. The question is, how do you prepare for it? And how do you sort of think through those things in advance? Because you're going to experience something. You're going to experience an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado or a fire. Um, so being prepared, being professional enough to think those things through in advance is really important for sanctuaries. I know Ed has experienced fire as well. I, I got to go home now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's true. We work, we do training with the highway patrol. We do, we have Cal Fire out. You know, you do everything you can. We, we have uh, a fire truck. You know, we do it, but we have 2,300 acres and it's, it's almost impossible to plan for everything like Sarah said. And, and so you do the best you can and you hope uh, it's not a 50 mile an hour wind when, when something does happen. We had a big fire within three or four miles of our place. Uh, a hundred square, bigger, twice as big as the one that's burning right now in California. So I just think it's going to get worse. Um, it just seems like the fires and the tornadoes and the hurricanes, everything is getting worse. And I think I, we kind of know why. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story and all of your others. I think it's a real, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a real testament to the work that is often done behind the scenes at sanctuaries. You hear about um, animals having victories, such as at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, when we say, oh, this, this animal will go to a sanctuary, but then they go there and so much has to be done to continue ha like helping that animal thrive. And um, so I'm just happy that we're recognizing it today. So thank you. We're going to meet back at 6 p.m.